Good afternoon, dear participants. My name is Andrei Cherkasky. I am the Deputy Director of the Institute of International Relations. I'm pleased to welcome you to our webinar, Visual Analytics for Monitoring of the distri Distributed Computing Infrastructures for Large-Scale Scientific Experiment. I'm pleased to pass the floor to our current speaker, an employee of the Laboratory of Computational Experiment and Modeling of the Scientific Research Computing Center of Moscow State University, participant of the ATLAS experiment, Maria Grigorieva. Maria, please take the floor. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, is everything okay with the sound? You can hear me? Yes, it's okay. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, so, Andre, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so, um, uh, what uh, a short overview about uh, myself and about uh, my work. Uh, so, as uh, Andre have already said, I'm working at the Lomonosov Moscow State University at the moment, and um, our current work. Uh, is uh, about uh, the monitoring and analysis on, of the functioning of uh, the computing infrastructure of uh, the LHC. Uh, we have a joint team uh, from Lomonosov University, from MIFI, and we collaborate with uh, CERN. And we carry out several very interesting projects, uh, and in this lecture I plan to talk about this. Uh, projects, not about all, of course, because uh, I think uh, uh, I can't cover everything uh, in one lecture, but uh, I'll tell about um, uh, two uh, the most um, important directions of uh, our research. Uh, so, a short outline. Uh, first, I'm going to describe uh, CERN computing infrastructure. Uh, we will talk about uh, the scale of this infrastructure, about some uh, components, especially about networks. Uh, then, I'll present the system of the visualization of network roads, uh, which was implemented by MIFI team, and this tool was highly appreciated at CERN, and it's been already integrated uh, in CERN computing infrastructure. That's very good result, I think. Uh, so next topic uh, is about the operational intelligence uh, uh, research project at CERN, which is totally devoted to the intelligent methods of data analysis, which is also very interesting. And in terms of uh, this big project, uh, the income of our team is the development of the cluster lock framework. Uh, so, and I'll tell a few words about this. Uh, uh, of course, our work and our research is not limited to, uh, to it, uh, but I think that for one lecture, it's more than enough because the material is not easy to comprehend. Um, so, Let's start uh, from the beginning. Uh, I don't know, uh, maybe you know about the LHC, about the CERN, and maybe you don't know, but um, uh, I just want to be sure that you know what's this. And uh, so that's why I uh, uh, made this overview slide about the LHC. So the LHC is the accelerator of particles and it pushes protons or ions uh, to near the speed of light. Uh, and it consists of 27 kilometer ring of superconducting magnets. Uh, you can see it on the picture, this uh, 27 kilometer ring. And it has a number of accelerating structures that boost the energy of the particles along the way of uh, this ring. Uh, so, um, uh, what's the goal of the LHC and what was the purpose uh, why it was constructed? Uh, the goal is to fill some gaps uh, in the standard model of particle physics. Uh, so the standard model uh, is a theory which was developed uh, in the uh, 70s and describes the fundamental particles and their uh, interactions. 
but the standard model is incomplete and it leaves many questions open. Uh, and the LHC was constructed uh, to uh, help to answer these questions. And what's these questions? I outlined uh, some of them. For example, uh, one of the questions is what's the origin of mass? Uh, you know that the standard model doesn't explain the origin of mass, so why uh, some particles are heavy or some particles have no mass at all, for example, uh, photons. And there were a theory about Higgs, about Higgs field, that particles that interact intensely with the Higgs field, uh, they are heavy, and those who are, um, that uh, have feeble interactions are light. And in uh, 2020, CERN announced the discovery of Higgs boson, which confirmed that uh, this uh, theory is... Uh, um, uh, but uh, this theory is still under investigation, and there are a lot of questions uh, still. Um, but uh, it was a very good result uh, of working of the uh, LHC. Uh, there are uh, a lot of other questions uh, which are not less important. For example, what's the supersymmetry about uh, dark matter and dark energy? Uh, maybe you know that uh, the matter which we know uh, and uh, this matter makes up all stars and galaxies. And it's, uh, it accounts only 4% of the content of the universe. Uh, and uh, other, um, all the rest uh, is dark matter and uh, dark energy. It accounts 23 and 73%. Uh, so LHC helps to investigate uh, this phenomena. Uh, also, uh, there are some investigations about antimatter uh, and uh, about uh, quark gluon plasma. So uh, I listed just uh, um, a list of uh, the most, uh, the biggest uh, investigations which uh, provided uh, at CERN. Uh, and what should be noted here, uh, the biggest experiments uh, at CERN are ATLAS and CMS. And uh, it's the general purpose detectors and they investigate a large uh, range of physics uh, phenomena. Uh, also, it has uh, uh, ELIS and LHCB experiments, but uh, these detectors uh, are more specialized and they are focusing on specific phenomena. Uh, so, but we are not going to dive deeply into these complicated questions of particle physics. Uh, let's move on. Uh, so, uh, LHC, of course, has a great contribution in the development of, uh, in, uh, in the evolvement of high energy physics. But besides, it has become one of the largest polygon of the research in big data. Uh, as the LHC and all its experiments uh, generates vast volumes of data, it has very complicated and diverse computing infrastructure. Uh, and this infrastructure is constantly growing, changing. Uh, so uh, now CERN is one of the most highly demanding computing environments in the research uh, world. Uh, computing is at the heart of CERN infrastructure. Uh, computing contains hardware infrastructure, software, data processing, data analysis, data management, data storage networks, and so on. And all this environment is used to support uh, for the LHC and non-LHC experiments um, uh, at CERN. Uh, and uh, I provided uh, these numbers for you uh, to understand better the scale of the LHC. Uh, for example, a uh, data center uh, at CERN consists of uh, 230,000 of processor cores and 50,000 servers, which run 24-7. Uh, uh, CERN experiments uh, generate uh, large volumes, so about 90 petabytes uh, per year. And additionally, non of HC experiments uh, add uh, uh, 25 petabytes of data each year. 
uh, data flow uh, uh, is also very uh, fast. It's about 25 gigabit, gigabyte per second. Uh, and the data storage uh, consists of uh, 70,000 of disks and 70 tapes. Uh, so uh, uh, the storage uh, distribution and analysis of all this data is provided by the uh, worldwide, worldwide LCG computing grid, uh, VLCG. And the next slide is about the VLCG. Uh, so VLCG is a big project. Uh, it combines the computing resources uh, of about nine, 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 900,000 computers, computer cores, uh, from over uh, 170 sites in uh, 42 countries all over the world. So we can say that VLCG is a massive distributed uh, computing infrastructure uh, and it provides more than uh, 12,000 physicists around the world uh, with the near real-time access to the LHC data. Uh, and it provides the power uh, to process this data. Uh, it runs over 2 million tasks per day. Uh, tasks, I mean, uh, uh, physics analysis and data processing tasks. And now global transfer rates uh, regularly exceeds uh, even six, uh, 60 gigabyte per second. Uh, so uh, the network infrastructure of the VLCG consists of uh, a lot of devices. Uh, for example, it, it has 300 rotors, 5,000 Wi-Fi points, uh, 4,000 switches, and in general about uh, 300,000 uh, connected devices. Uh, so, and about the data storage uh, of uh, VLCG project, it has now uh, exabyte, exabyte data storage, 50 peta, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 500 petabytes on disks and uh, 500 uh, petabytes on tapes. Uh, so, and uh, CERN provides about 20% of the resources of VLCG. Uh, so, uh, one of the most impressive components uh, of the VLCG is its networking and connectivity. Uh, it provides the distribution of data to the hundreds of collaborating institutes all over the world. And all this is possible thanks to the excellent connectivity uh, and uh, networking infrastructure at CERN. Uh, VLCG uh, is made up of four la layers, uh, or uh, they call it tires, uh, zero, one, second, and third. Each tire provides a specific set of services. Uh, for example, uh, tier zero uh, in the center of this picture uh, is the uh, CERN data center. It's located in Geneva, Switzerland. All the data from the LHC passes through this central hub. Uh, tier zero is responsible for the safekeeping of uh, raw data from all uh, detectors, uh, from all experiments uh, from the LHC, and the first data reconstruction. Uh, next tire is uh, tier one. Um, uh, uh, there's a, a, a 13 a large computing center. Uh, which has uh, have uh, sufficient storage capacity, and they are responsible for the safekeeping of proportional share of raw and reconstructed data, uh, and also it provides large scale reprocessing and safekeeping of corresponding output, and distribution of data to the next tier to tier two. Uh, tier two are typically university and other scientific institutes uh, which can store sufficient data and provide some adequate computing power for specific uh, physics analysis tasks. And currently there are about uh, 160 uh, tier two sites uh, covering most of the globe. And uh, tier three, uh, these are individual scientists which uh, access uh, computing facilities through local computing resources. It can be uh, some uh, clusters, uh, local clusters at university department or even just an individual uh, personal computer. 
so uh, VLCG has such a, a multi-tiered structure. Uh, and uh, at the beginning, uh, this model uh, had the hierarchical structure. It means that data from tier uh, zero uh, transferred at tier one and from there to tier two. Uh, so uh, only uh, in this direction. But later it became more flexible and uh, as networks uh, showed um, robustness, a good capacity. Uh, so now data can be transferred in any direction between uh, tier one and tier two. It's just uh, important for the understanding of the complexity of uh, the structure. Uh, so, um, in fact, uh, the network uh, proved to be one of the most reliable uh, components of the VLCG architecture. Uh, and uh, thanks to the constant progress in the network industry, uh, the capacity has grown uh, very uh, well beyond the initial expectations. Uh, so LHC uses private optical networks uh, which are separate the LHC traffic from other global internet networks. Uh, CERN currently has two main private networks. Uh, these are LHC OPN and LHC One. Uh, LHC uh, OPN optical private network was de deployed to enable distribution uh, of uh, data from tier zero to tier one sites and also to support data movement between uh, tier one sites. And LHC one supports uh, uh, the data movement between uh, tier one and tier two sites. Uh, so I see that uh, the internet connection uh, is unstable. So uh, I'm sorry, I'll turn off uh, my video. Uh, maybe uh, the connection will be better. I'll turn turn off uh, turn on video later. So okay, um, so I'll stop uh, at the LHC one. So LHC uh, OPN uh, is uh, for tier zero and tier one, and LHC one is uh, provide provides data movement between tier one and tier two sites and between all pairs of tier two sites. And you can see uh, the complexity of in, in these pictures, the complexity of the network connections between all uh, data centers all over the world. So it's very complex uh, network environment. Uh, it should be noted that connections, network connections between uh, tier one uh, and tier zero are built on a very well provisioned uh, private optical network because these networks are responsible for the transfer of the initial of the raw data from the LHC. It's very important for these channels to be very reliable. Uh, so these connections are enough stable. Uh, but the mesh of network connections between uh, tier one and tier two sites and between pairs of tier two might have frequent problems uh, with connectivity and data transfer performance. Uh, and, uh, and it can cause some problems. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the connectivity between two sites uh, can be very low. Uh, and to fix this issue, uh, sometimes uh, it can, can spend uh, several days. To ensure sites and experiments can better understand and fix networking issues, uh, CERN started to use uh, specific um, uh, software, Perfsonar. Uh, it's a web-based, uh, web service-based infrastructure, uh, allows to con collect and publish network performance monitoring uh, metrics. Uh, so the next slide is about this uh, tool. Uh, so the primary goal of Personar is uh, uh, making it easier to solve end-to-end -end performance problems. 
uh, it contains a set of services uh, uh, which uh, measure uh, different uh, performance metrics uh, in the federated environments. Uh, and currently, PerfSonar instances are installed at more than 120 at CERN computing sites or CERN computing uh, centers. And they provide ongoing collection of network measurements uh, like network topology, uh, latency, packet loss, and throw output. Uh, so uh, network uh, measurements, of course, needs some visual representation for the analysis, for operators who monitor the ne network. Uh, and this slide shows the VLCG PerfSonar dashboard uh, which uh, uses by the operators who monitor uh, network connections. Uh, as you can see here, the characteristics of network connections between all pair of uh, sites uh, of tier one, zero in tier one, uh, are shown here as matrices. Uh, left picture uh, shows the bandwidth. Uh, it means how many gigabits of data can be transferred over the network per second. Uh, and visually, this is represented as a matrix. Uh, each element of this matrix shows a metric between a pair of sites, of computing sites. And color of the box uh, is characterizes a quality uh, of uh, bandwidth. Uh, if green, uh, good throw output, uh, red, uh, bad throw output. So, uh, middle picture uh, describes the uh, network delay or latency. Um, after how many times the packet sent uh, from point A will be at point B. Uh, and again, the same uh, matrix, matrix representation. Uh, uh, so, and uh, uh, finally, uh, on the right, uh, you can see uh, network roads uh, matrix representation. Uh, it shows the number of network roads between each pair of sites for a specific um, uh, time interval. Uh, for example, if the road uh, between site A and site B uh, hasn't changed for some time period, then this road, network road, is considered to be uh, reliable, stable, and uh, it's uh, highlighted with green color. If there are more than two roads um, uh, on between these uh, sites, it means that connection is less stable. Uh, so uh, the uh, boxes, corresponding boxes, are highlighted with the yellow or red color. Uh, but uh, besides the fact that we have the information about the number of roads, uh, we can see uh, what kind of roads uh, are these, uh, what is their length, uh, how optimal they are, uh, and we need some uh, sometimes to reconstruct uh, the network path, network road to analyze it. Uh, and this task was addressed to our team uh, and uh, the team from MIFI developed a specialized tool for this task, uh, which includes uh, three-dimensional graph visualization. And on the next slide, I'll present um, this tool. But first, uh, a few words about uh, the network routing. Uh, what's this and uh, how it's measured and which information we use uh, to, uh, for a visualization platform. Uh, so network routing is the process of selecting a path in a network or between or across multiple networks. Uh, a packet delivery route between networks is constructed through transit nodes, which is called hops. Um, it can be, for example, uh, routers. Uh, network routing provides the study of the network. Uh, it chooses the optimal route uh, and transfer packets from the source to the receiver. Uh, and these network roads can be specified uh, administratively, for example, by system administrator, 
uh, and then uh, it's static road, roads. Or it can be calculated using routing, specialized routing algorithms based on information about the topology, network status, or uh, some other parameters. Then these roads are called dynamic roads. Uh, in our case, uh, we deal uh, mostly with dynamic roads. Uh, so, and uh, for a rotor, the road selection criteria uh, may, may include uh, the network bandwidth, uh, the communication channels, uh, if they overloaded, for example, uh, delays, uh, number of intermediate transit nodes, and reliable reliability of channels. So it takes into account a lot of uh, network characteristics to choose uh, the most optimal uh, network road. Uh, network roads in CERN uh, networks are measured by personar instances at each computing site uh, and all these measures are periodically saved in special storage. Uh, and for example, here on this picture, you can see one network road between two computing sites at CERN, between site A and site B. Uh, the road consists of seven hops. It means that uh, when data is transferred from site A to site uh, B, it goes uh, through uh, seven rotors. Uh, and uh, for each rotors, we, ha we have uh, IP address, as you can see it. Um, so personal instance sends packets between sites and recorded these roads uh, with all necessary data. It records uh, IP address and host names. Additionally, a personnel measures time, uh, measures time before each hope, before each uh, rotor. And all this data is stored in a database. Uh, this data were used, data were used to develop the uh, personnel, personnel visualization system. Um, so, uh, this slide shows the interface of this system for visualizing network roads between VLCG sites. Uh, so, in the left pane, uh, you can select some time interval. Uh, you can select also source sites and destination sites between which you want to see the network roads. And all network roads between the selected uh, sites uh, in, in the selected time interval will be visualized in the form of directional, three-dimensional graph. Each node is represented in the form of sphere. Uh, lines are connections between them. Uh, the purple sphere is the source. Uh, the blue one uh, is uh, the um, destination. And uh, the red one uh, is the sphere um, with no source in the database. For example, um, some values, uh, some parameters may be missed in the database, uh, like IP address or time delay. And it means that a personnel uh, couldn't measure uh, these values. And it indicates that there are some problem uh with the uh, personal measurement uh and uh, problem in network road uh so below the main picture uh you can see the summary table of all roads uh and you can select any row in this table and the network road uh that corresponds to this um, uh, path will be highlight highlighted on the graph using animated small spheres uh, passing between all intermediate nodes, hops. Uh, the speed of movement of, of uh, small spheres shows the speed of data exchange between nodes. And on the graph, uh, on the right, on the histogram, uh, you can see uh, the time delays uh, to each um, uh, internal um, uh, hop. Uh, so, um, this is our visualization. Uh, the next slide shows that you can select another row in the table, uh, which is below. 
Uh, and you can see that uh, in this case, a different road uh, is highlighted on the graph. Um, so we can view all existing network path, uh, in particular time interval. Next, what we can do here, we can also aggregate existing path, existing network road and see their average representation. Uh, this way we hide the similar roads. It's useful when we analyze, uh, for example, network roads for a long period of time, because uh, for where we analyze, uh, for example, a day or a week, there could be too many lines, uh, too many road, uh, roads and uh, each, each line corresponding to the personal road measurement. But we don't need all of these measures. We just need only roads. Uh, so we can just fold up this. Uh, next slide shows an example of data analysis that can be carried out in this visualization system. Uh, for example, uh, in the selected time interval, we examined the path, the network roads between two pairs of sites. Uh, red balls indicates that uh, certain rotors do not respond uh, to a request from personnel uh, tool uh, that tries to measure uh, the network pass. Uh, and a loss of network pass data is observed at the nodes uh, of the graph at the beginning at, at the end. We can see the red uh, spheres. Uh, this nodes didn't respond during repeated measurements and the path itself reached the final node. So we can see that the path in, is completed. Uh, so uh, we can assume that this loss, losses, these data losses occur due to the security settings of the respecting rotors. Uh, this is just an example of the possible analysis. Uh, the next slide uh, shows uh, a case a case with the self-cycling rotors. You can see that uh, a rotor uh, repeatedly transmits data to itself. Uh, it, it's self-looped. Uh, and as a result, all packets uh, are lost and that data transfer from site A to site B is interrupted and the, all the road is read. Uh, so the road is not completed in this case. And here we can clearly say that which rotors are, are self-looped. Uh, you can see it at the beginning of the road and at the end. Uh, and we can initiate a change uh, in their configuration settings. So it's one of the most representative examples of, um, of the, the possible data analysis uh, using this tool. Uh, so as I've already said, currently it's uh, already implemented and it's uh, within the CERN infrastructure. Uh, uh, so, and uh, it's the income of a uh, team uh, from NIFI. Um, so, uh, and this what was the first part uh, of my talk. Um, it was devoted to the networks and uh, the second part will be devoted to the operational intelligent uh, project. Uh, so, uh, operational intelligent project uh, is uh, completely another direction of uh, the research. Uh, it's a joint effort uh, of high energy physics uh, collaboration, collaboration, and its main goal is to reduce the operational costs of complex computing infrastructure by increasing the level of automation in operations. Uh, and this will be achieved through the development of stack of intelligent tools and technologies uh, which aims uh, to detect, analyze, and predict some anomalies in the computing environment uh, to suggest uh, possible actions and uh, automate operation procedures. Uh, examples of uh, such tools are uh, smart alerting systems, 
recommendation systems for the operators or predictive maintenance uh, throughout log analysis. And the landscape of applicable technologies and methods um, uh, includes, but not limited uh, to, uh, data mining, machine learning, uh, predictive analytics, interactive data uh, visualization, visual ana analysis, natural language processing, deep learning, uh, ne neural networks, uh, and so on. So here we, ha we have a lot of intelligent um, data analysis, intelligent analysis of big data. Uh, that is very interesting and very important. Uh, CERN uh, itself has very complex, heterogeneous and dynamically changing environment. Uh, and uh, the monitoring, operation, maintenance of the computing infrastructure uh, must guarantee uh, on the other, on the one hand, um, constant and uh, utilization of the available resources, and on the other hand, uh, high data throughout put uh, according to the physics, physics goals and priorities uh, set by each experiment. Uh, as any complex system, uh, CERN computing environment may behave unstable due to various levels, due to various reasons. Uh, some issues uh, can be on the application level, on middleware level, network level, resource level, uh, and um, uh, issues can be uh, uh, caused by different uh, reasons. So, uh, and uh, you should understand that uh, many uh, workload and data management routine operations are already automated at CERN, of course. Um, so, and here I outlined um, the routines which has, has already been uh, automated. Uh, for example, job dispatching and scheduling, uh, brokerage of uh, physics analysis tasks, uh, recovery of failed jobs, uh, for example, uh, replication of popular data, uh, deletion or archival of unused data. Um, um, sometimes uh, when uh, some um, uh, resource uh, are failed, it can be automatically excluded from the global infrastructures. Um, however, uh, most issues uh, still need to be spotted manually uh, by teams or operators, uh, and some of them need the intervention of experts to be resolved. Uh, operators of various teams are constantly checking uh, several sources of aggregated information such as uh, test results, system performance metrics, or system logs uh, to uh, analyze possible issues and take appropriate actions. Uh, often uh, some failures uh, in uh, one subsystem or facility can generate failures in a multitude of other systems, uh, causing some uh, kind of avalanche effect. Uh, and uh, operators need to be able to correlate uh, various sources of information to find the root cause of the issue. Uh, and uh, once this cause uh, has found, uh, it may either be solved by the operators themselves uh, following documented procedure or escalated to the relevant, uh, relevant experts. And this escalation is currently being done either in the form of email, uh, chat, meeting, or most frequently by using a ticket system uh, like Jira, uh, Snow, Gagus, uh, etc. It's, it's a ticket system uh, which helps to notify about some issues. Uh, so currently, uh, experiments at CERN uh, claim to have about uh, 100 persons involved uh, at various levels in global computing operations. It means that uh, 100 persons uh, are involved in the monitoring of system and uh, 
uh, fixing uh, some uh, failures. And of course, all these people uh, um, find uh, some issues and create uh, tickets, uh, notifications about uh, failures. Uh, and the uh, number of tickets is very, is, is quite big. Um, and uh, uh, it requires a, a lot of uh, time sometimes to uh, resolve the issues. Uh, for example, sometimes uh, when some some operator find the issue and create a ticket in uh, ticketing system uh, and to the resolve of this issue, it can uh, have several days. Uh, so it's quite a lot. Uh, and uh, this slide, uh, uh, this picture you can see, it demonstrates uh, the monitoring and maintenance operations uh, uh, today, how it is today at CERN. Uh, and so human power is highlighted with orange and computing power uh, is highlighted with green color. Uh, so you can see at the top of this picture a number of people, uh, they are operators or, or analytics which are monitor uh, distributed computing environment. Uh, uh, yes, uh, by the way, I see the chat. If you have questions, you can ask here and maybe I try to answer them uh, uh, now or later. Please feel free uh, to ask. Uh, so, um, uh, so these experts, these operators, analyze al alerts or signals from various devices. Uh, and they uh, have to uh, explore, to observe some specific plots, tables, and monitoring systems. And uh, looking at this um, uh, different visualization, etc., they try to localize the issue and uh, the failed components maybe in the of the infrastructure. And after that, uh, they create issue tickets, notifications. Uh, uh, it's like a notification with the description of the issue. And these tickets is sent via email, chat, Jira, and other issue systems. Uh, and then responsible executors perform some actions and uh, to correct the situation, to fix the problem. Uh, and to maintain CERN computing infrastructure, we need a lot of operators, which uh, write a lot of uh, issue tickets daily. Uh, so uh, what do we want to do next? Uh, what will happen tomorrow? Uh, as all the issue tickets is saved in the database uh, and all the descriptions and all proposed actions of system administrators, so the next stage uh, is to analyze all information about these alerts, about problems, about issues, and about methods for solving them. Uh, we can use all accumulated data from all issues to train machine learning algorithms how to respond to a particular alert. Uh, as a result, it will allow to automate some user actions, some uh, actions of the operators. And, and then, uh, um, operations after tomorrow, uh, and ideally, we will uh, significantly, significantly sorry, reduce the amount of human resources, um, of required human resources, uh, by shifting most of the routine work uh, of processing alerts to a computer. Uh, and that's the main goal of the operational intelligence project. Um, uh, we want to uh, automate as much as possible. But it's not limited to it. Uh, this project have a lot of analytics initiatives in various fields. Uh, one of the most important uh, is the analysis of log messages. Because uh, you know that uh, analysis of uh, failure logs, of error messages, is one of the central component of uh, all analytics uh, system of monitoring systems. Uh, 
issue understanding and uh, mitigating can be improved uh, by pre-processing, combining and correlating data from different sources. Uh, and here you can see uh, examples of textual error messages uh, which uh, allow to detect, often allow to detect the reason of the issue. And now uh, operators in turn analyze this, uh, all these error messages, uh, in fact, manually, by hand. Uh, but the complexity of computing system is constantly rising uh, and it provokes growing of the number of these error messages. Uh, and uh, more and more human resources are needed to read and explore all these messages. Uh, but this process can be automated and our team is involved in this process. And on the next slide, I'll, slides, I'll, I'm going to show how we do it. Um, uh, so, uh, but first, if we talk about the number of failures, here is a great uh, representative example. Uh, it's a plot with a distribution of job statuses uh, for each hour during one day. Uh, for example, and here we can see that uh, uh, jobs uh, which failed with, uh, with failed jobs uh, is about 10% of all uh, completed jobs. Uh, when I say job, I mean that uh, it's some um, uh, physics analysis or data processing uh, job uh, carry, carried out uh, in the distributed environment at CERN. Uh, so, for example, uh, on this plot, we can see that uh, we had uh, one and a half of million uh, jobs completed jobs uh, for one day and uh, it has about 160,000 uh, error, errors, error messages. Uh, sometimes the number of failed jobs may be much bigger, uh, up to 2 million for example. And uh, each error message is stored in the database and of course we need to have some specific tools uh, allowing to analyze the error messages automatically, not to do it by hand, uh, as the number of errors is uh, quite big. Uh, and this on this slide, I presented some methods, some existing methods of parsing and analyzing logs. Um, so the picture on the right shows what the log is and what's the result of the log analysis. Uh, so a log is a string that contains a date, timestamp, a mode of the log. It can be a uh, warning, a debug, info and error, and the error message itself. And the parse log is a presentation of data in a structured form. Uh, thus, in messages, the main part is separated from a uh, domain-specific part, for example, from IP addresses, line numbers, file path, U URI, etc. Uh, so, uh, in total, there are about uh, 13 applications. They are listed in the table uh, at the left. These applications for uh, tools uh, to analyze, to parse logs, um, uh, and they uh, can be classified by different methods. Uh, some of them use frequency pattern extraction, some of them use machine learning, and some of them use heuristic methods. Uh, and also some of them are fast, some of them slower, and uh, only five of them are open source. Uh, so, uh, I won't stop in detail uh, on uh, these methods because uh, uh, it's not applicable uh, to the analysis of error messages for CERN computing. Um, we can't use these methods directly uh, since they are essentially aimed at looking for similar text patterns, only similar text patterns uh, in error messages. But our task is to perform such an analysis that will allow us to group error messages not only by text patterns, but by semantic content, by the initial reason of error. Uh, what I mean, uh, for example, um, uh, all messages, uh, we, we need to group all messages that indicate 
for example, uh, that server doesn't have enough memory in one group. Messages that has uh, some authentication uh, error uh, in another group. Uh, if you can, uh, uh, as you can see on this slide, for example, no such file or directory messages in uh, next group. A copy failed uh, another group. But uh, uh, in spite all these messages in these groups has the se similar uh, problem, uh, the similar issue, uh, you can see that text patterns are maybe completely different. Uh, so, and our goal is to um, group, categorize messages automatically by the reasons, by the reasons. Uh, so, uh, on this slide, uh, uh, there is a general stages of uh, our clusterization algorithm. Uh, the stages are tokenization, uh, vectorization, of tokens, vectorization of messages, and clusterization. Uh, so uh, a few words about each stage, because I think it's very important. Uh, and uh, uh, you can uh, maybe use uh, some of these uh, methods in your research, for example. Uh, so, tokenization is the process of dividing the text into sequence of smaller parts, words, tokens, symbols, digits, uh, etc. And it's uh, these parts are called tokens. Uh, so, the list of tokens and then used as the input for the next uh, text processing stage, vectorization. Uh, and uh, it uh, so uh, when we tokenized each uh, message, each error message, uh, we can build a vocabulary which include all tokens from all error messages. Uh, so the next stage is to represent each token by a set of numerical parameters. So uh, for your understanding, uh, to uh, when we have initially the text, we need to clusterize uh, some uh, strings the first thing we should do is to convert these strings to numbers because we can clusterize strings, we can cluster, but we can clusterize numbers. So the main question is how to convert these strings to the numbers. Uh, so and uh, after tokenization, we uh, uh, vectorize each token. Uh, we built uh, a vector space model of tokens uh, using word to vec algorithm implemented by Google in 2013. And I'll explain this method uh, uh, at the next slide. Uh, but uh, after we tokenize, uh, sorry, vectorize tokens, we have to vectorize uh, sentences, messages. Uh, uh, and this the third stage. Um, uh, messages vectorization is a mathematical average of the vector representation of all tokens in the uh, initial message. Uh, and then a vector model of messages is used by a clusterization algorithm to split all messages into similar groups. Uh, so that's a simple description of uh, the clusterization pipeline, but of course it has much more interim stages. I just won't tell about them uh, as they are very specific uh, and uh, we don't have enough time to cover it all. I'll tell only about some important stages which I hope you can then explore more detailed and use in your investigations. Uh, so, at the next slide, uh, I, I wanted to show how we build the vector space model of tokens. Uh, for this, we use word embeddings method. Uh, the main idea of this method is that the meaning of each word uh, can be inferred by its neighbors, by its context. Uh, word embedding is a set of techniques in natural language processing uh, where tokens from vocabulary are mapped into a numerical vector. Uh, so uh, this mapping is implemented using neural networks algorithms. Uh, uh, so, and the result, uh, each term, 
uh, is represented within the context uh, in which words, in which token, tokens it appears. At pictures below, there are uh, examples of numerical vector representations uh, of token. Uh, for example, you can see um, the vector uh, which has multiple features and these are representation of one token. Uh, but uh, you should understand that all these features in, the, in this vector, they, uh, in general, they don't have any meaning, like, for example, position of token of, or frequency of token. This feature, this feature just represents the model of a context uh, for this token. And if we try to highlight it, each feature uh, value by some color, from uh, red to green, we will see that this vector are coded as a context of tokens. And using this representation, we can search similar tokens and the similarity is defined by similar context vectors. Uh, as an example, I provided most similar tokens uh, for words source and word destination. Uh, which, uh, and these two words uh, are mentioned uh, together uh, in a lot of error messages. And we can see that really uh, word to vec model thinks the same. Uh, the most similar word for the source is destination uh, and vice versa. Uh, so a word to vec model is very useful and it allows to decode a, each token by numbers describing their context. And it means that the word to vec model represents the meaning of tokens. Uh, so and we used it uh, uh, in our uh, clusterization uh, method. Uh, uh, and another point which I wanted to highlight here is the clusterization uh, method um, algorithm. Uh, you know that there are a lot of different uh, algorithms uh, for clusterization which allow to split data into groups uh, sharing similar, similar parameters. Uh, but uh, most algorithms require to install uh, some initial knowledge about data. For example, they require the knowledge of the number of clusters. Uh, how many groups or clusters do you think uh, your data may have? But in our case, when we analyze error messages, uh, which may be absolutely different, uh, which may have absolutely different uh, various uh, textual pattern, uh, we don't know in advance the number of clusters, number of groups. Uh, it can't be predicted anyway. Uh, so uh, the dbscan, is one of the algorithms which don't need uh, the number of cluster and we can use it. Uh, the density-based clustering algorithm uh, uh, makes an assumption that clusters are dense regions in space uh, separated by regions of lower density. Uh, so, um, since there, these algorithms expand clusters based on dense connectivity, they can find clusters of any shape uh, and doesn't require uh, to specify the exact amount of cluster. Instead, uh, it requires uh, two parameters, uh, this algorithm, uh, the epsilon and the mean samples. Uh, the epsilon parameter is the maximum distance between two points uh, to be considered as a neighbors, uh, to be considered as belonging to one cluster. So it can be said that uh, epsilon, epsilon is intra-cluster distance between points. And mean samples is the number of samples in the neighborhood for a point to be considered as a core point. Uh, and so um, the epsilon parameter is the most important for clusterization and it, it can be calculated based on data. And, uh, we, in, and we do it based on data and um, we have uh, some additional uh, stages uh, in the clusterization pipeline to uh, detect uh, this epsilon parameter for the dbscan. 
so and as a result finally uh we uh apply the db scan uh, algorithm to uh, represent numerical representation of error messages and it groups uh, all messages uh, into clusters and the results uh, are quite accurate for example like this on this slide I showed some results um, of clusterization of messages uh, here is the fragment of table describe and detect the groups of error messages uh, the first column uh, is the size of a group it means how many error messages are in this group the second column is the textual pattern of messages in this group and the third column uh, is the automatically extracted key keywords and key phrases in of all messages in the group uh, so now this clusterization pipeline is under development and we are going to integrate it uh, in CERN computing environment very soon uh, and uh, our next goal is to learn how to group messages automatically by keywords key phrases uh, like here for example to group messages uh, with authorization authentication errors or to group messages with login error separately uh, and it should be done automatically without human interven intervention uh, so um, I think that uh, I can finish uh, uh, at this um, and this slide is about our, our other research uh, for example, what we can do else uh, about the monitoring and uh, data analysis uh, for CERN. Um, another direction of our investigation is the parallel coordinates visualization for the analysis of high dimensional data. Uh, it's also uh, done by uh, MIFI team. Uh, and we have already good results with it. Uh, also, we are involved in the analysis of slow computing tasks. Uh, it means that uh, in a certain computing environment, uh, some user analysis tasks can uh, last uh, more than two weeks. And we try to analyze why it happens and what we can do to avoid such uh, time delays. And finally, uh, now we started the uh, research of data popularity for user analysis. Uh, data popularity, it means that uh, all data, uh, data sets uh, at CERN uh, may be popular and may be less popular. And the popularity measures uh, are used uh, for data placement, for data distribution, uh, to make replicas of data or to uh, delete this data. Uh, and uh, this uh, popularity uh, measures uh, are very important, has become very important, especially uh, when uh, um, after the LHC upgrade, uh, when the number, the amount of data, the volume of data will grow, grow up significantly. Uh, so this our the overview of our investigations. Uh, so I, I'll, I, I'll try to can turn on my camera. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, I provided some resources. Uh, first resource for a Russian speaker. Um, it's uh, the paper of our colleague from CERN. Uh, another uh, paper about the networks. And uh, two, uh, finally, uh, three and four, it's about the log clusters. Uh, so below, there is my uh, CERN email. Uh, so if you have uh, some uh, questions uh, you can write uh, and I'll try to answer uh, so I think uh, that we can finish I think that the information was 
uh, that we have a lot of information and it's of course not easy to uh, understand it from scratch so if you have any questions you can ask here please Yes, thank you very much, Maria, for a very interesting webinar. So, are there any questions for our speaker today? Please, you're welcome or in chat, or I can <clears throat> uh, go on the air. Well, I have one question, I think. Uh, can you guide us on the BERT technique? Mm. Hmm. Uh, unfortunately, I don't uh, know what's the bird technique. Maybe I... Uh... Uh, maybe... Maybe... Uh... It's some abbreviation, we just... Uh... Well, I can connect oh. the participant to our conference to uh, set the question, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I see next question about uh, choosing clustering algorithm. Uh, so, uh, it very depends on the initial data. Uh, for example, uh, when we uh, investigated, uh, worked on the algorithm for log analysis, uh, we tried different clusterization algorithms uh, uh, like dbscan, optics, hdbscan, which uh, do, don't require the initial number of clusters and uh, how to say uh, we decided that the BISCAN uh, provides the best results the most accurate results uh, so uh, there I, I mean that uh, there is no uh, answer to this question you need just to try different algorithms and uh, look the results it very depends on the data about uh, which laboratory I work at CERN I don't work at CERN laboratory uh, uh, so uh, uh, I just collaborate with uh, CERN and uh, especially But I work at uh, Moscow State University. So, more questions? I still uh, wonder what's this uh, BERT uh, technology because it's very something very familiar but uh... well the, the participant mm -hmm. is not uh, uh, in connection to with us some uh, problem with the mm -hmm. well uh, any question mm -hmm. for our speaker please I see uh, one question about uh, job parameters. Yeah, yeah. A minute. Uh, I think it's corresponding to this slide. Uh, closed jobs, no. Uh, closed jobs uh, doesn't mean it doesn't mean that they failed. Uh, it, it, it just means that these jobs were uh, closed by some reason and uh, it will be uh, re executed. Uh, so,
We have a question about the bad technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't use this. Um, maybe I should uh, uh, investigate it separately, but uh, currently we use only word embeddings and it uh, provides uh, quite good results. So, uh, about BERT, unfortunately, I can't answer. I have no experience in this yet. Well, I think if mm -hmm. we have any question, uh, our participants can uh, send it to your email address and uh, connect yes. with you by the email. And so again, uh, the last time, yes, with yeah. my mail. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thanks again, Maria, for participating for uh, this uh, interesting lecture. To, uh, audio, to our audience, uh, thank you, and we will, uh, mm, I think we will meet <laughs> one more, it is it's, uh, interesting for our audience, that's why, Andrea, thanks a lot, and, uh, yes? Yes, Andre, I see a question. Uh, how does MIFI connect it with okay. CERN? I think it's very important. <laughs> Maybe you can answer. Yeah, okay. <laughs> of course, yes. Um, okay. Uh, some, uh, some of our um, specialists are the participant of CERN collaboration and uh, in different uh, in different spheres or in a uh, uh, question of high matter or sorry um, um, high matter dark matter or in um, the question of uh, visualization and IT infrastructure that's why it's very um, very wild uh, field uh, to connect with the CERN and uh, different experiments uh, in this uh, physical um, in this physical sphere uh, yes I can add that uh, I know that MIFI has a very wide collaboration with uh, CERN in terms of physics in terms of high energy physics and uh, uh, CERN has uh, uh, a lot of physics from uh, MIFI uh, working at CERN and uh, now we started the collaboration in, in terms of computing. Uh, so in some ways yeah. of detectors, in some way of uh, computer science, uh, it was some uh, interesting uh, sphere of uh, e uh, experiments with the, uh, well, I I try to remember, okay, if I send to our participants uh, the information, if it's uh, interesting to, to them about our connection with CERN. Because we have about 25 to 30 part participants of this collaboration by me, Murphy. Yeah, Maria? Some yes, yes. Uh, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think there, there are no more questions. Uh, and uh, if yeah. uh, guys, have uh, please feel free to write me <laughs> yeah
If no more question, we uh, thanks again our speaker today, Maria. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I hope that it uh, not enough our <laughs> webinar with you. See you later. Thank you. I hope to. Okay. See you. Bye. 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 Bye.